Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 13th of November and it's finally cold here in Texas, so I can stop wearing t-shirts. As always, I've got the chapters for the updates. You can jump to a particular one you care about the most. New videos this week. I created a video all about thinking of maintaining and upgrading your Azure Kubernetes service. Yes, it's PaaS, but there's still things I need to think about with regards to the Kubernetes version, with regards to my node images and actions I may need to take. So I go through the entire set of things to think about in that video. On to what's new, on the compute side, we now have this ability to export logic apps using the VS Code Logic App Standard Extension. What that's gonna let me do is in Azure today, I might have consumption-based or those integration service environment-based logic apps that I can now export out to a Logic Apps Standard project. Now, the big deal about Logic Apps Standard is this is the new engine that runs on top of the Azure Functions extensibility, meaning I can run those logic apps anywhere I can run an Azure function, including, hey, I can run them locally on my machine to debug, troubleshoot, and then publish them off somewhere. So what this is gonna let me do is move off of those older consumption, those ISE plans. I could run it locally to debug, maybe tweak some things I have to do, and then push it out to move to the regular single tenant logic app standard plans, for example, in Azure. There are now VM software reservations. We're used to the idea of an Azure reservation, like a, a reserved instance. Hey, I commit to use a certain amount of something and I get a discount. Well, this is very similar to those. So now I can commit to using a certain amount of a software product, a third party software product, for one or three year term and a certain amount of that, and in return I'm gonna get a discount. So here it's things like Citrix, uh, Red Hat, Canonical, and that billing engine, just like with reserved instances, will wake up and apply the discount up to that amount of the software product that I've purchased for the particular VM instance flexibility plan that I've purchased it for. There are new Azure VMware um, solution node sizes. So if we have, have a quick look at this, it probably makes more sense. If we go and look, we have now in these new regions, I do not want to participate, but we have this AV36P. So it has more RAM, more NVMe storage over the old AV36, and then the AV52, a much bigger box. So those are available in various regions um, around the world. So if you're gonna use an Azure VMware solution, hey, there are these new node sizes available for you. Static web apps now have .NET 7 and Node 18 support and a whole bunch more. So the whole point of static web apps is for that pre-rendered code, I can just host it in the Azure Static Web App and it makes it geo-redundant, makes it globally available, and I really don't have to think about very much at all. So now those .NET 7 Blazor uh, WebAssembly apps, they can run there. For the backend APIs, I can now use .NET 7 Azure Functions with them. I can run full stack Node 18 applications. And as part of this, I can now actually skip API builds for my static web apps if I don't need it. GitLab, Bitbucket are now supported, along with stable URLs. So stable URLs are all about, hey, if I do a push to my main branch, before I do, sorry, when if I put in a pull request, before I actually do a merge, what it will do is it will go and deploy that to a temporary environment with a stable URL. So I always know where that URL will be, so I can go and look at it and check, do I actually want to go and merge and accept that pull request? It's also now gonna do that for non-production branches. It will add in the name of the branch, once again, it will go and deploy that into an environment with a stable URL. It'll have the name of the branch in that. So a number of updates to those static web apps. And I mentioned Azure Functions running .NET 7. Well, Azure Functions v4 in the isolated worker mode can now run those .NET 7 runtimes. So the whole point of the isolated worker is it's running on a certain host, and that host has a certain runtime installed on it, 
or the isolated worker lets me use a version of the runtime different than what's running on the actual underlying host operating system um, that's running that actual Azure function. Azure Kubernetes Service now has SSH key rotation in preview. So when I have my Linux nodes, we can use SSH to connect to them for certain troubleshooting purposes, for example. And if I wanted to rotate the SSH key, what I had to do in the past was I had to re-image the virtual machine scale set that actually powers the individual node pools of my AKS. There was a fair a lot of work to do that. What this now enables me to do at the AKS cluster level, I can say, hey, I've got a new SSH key. This could be just, hey, the key, the key file, and it will now automatically deploy that to all of the underlying virtual machine scale set instances that make up all the node pools in that cluster. Now, behind the scenes, it's doing a re-image of all of the nodes and all of the node pools, but I don't have to do that anymore. It's really shifting the responsibility from me having to go and rebuild all the VMSS to now, hey, AKS cluster, push out this new SSH key for me, and it will go and do that deployment to all of the VMSS scale sets for me, and it will go and do that re-imaging. Um, Azure NetApp Files is now available for the Azure VMware solution. So the whole point now is those private cloud clusters I have running VMware, if the local vSAN storage I get from the VMware solution is not meeting my requirements, maybe capacity, maybe performance, I can now go and hook into those Azure NetApp files powered by NetApp filers behind the scenes with some very, very high performance tiers. Those NFS volumes it makes available, I can now go and use as part of my private cluster in the Azure VMware solutions. So that's a really big deal where I want to really push the boundaries of the storage. Networking side, uh, new default rule set 2.1 for web application firewall. This is only for the global web application firewall. I, this is part of Azure Front Door Premium that I'm adding onto that. So this is all based on the OWASP core rule set 3.3.2, which really, the whole point of this default rule set 2.1 is it builds on that standard set, but Microsoft's own threat intelligence team tweak that. They make various changes to increase its detection, to remove false positives. And hey, I can now just leverage that um, in my GA environments. And this, this protects against a whole bunch of things. Think about things like SQL injection, Node.js attacks, cross-site scripting, PHP injection, a remote code execution, the list goes on. This gives me those protections from that. Um, block of domain fronting behavior on Azure Front Door and Azure CDN. So this is now GA. It's gonna happen by default for any new deployments, and I can raise a support ticket if I want to have this behavior now blocked on any existing environment I may have. And just to understand what this, the point of this is, is imagine you have that Azure, could be content delivery network, or that Azure front door, which remember these make content available to me. The issue could be is if, hey, if I'm on some client machine and there's some censorship going on, I go through saying that's doing some censorship, maybe restricting what I can access. Well, one of the techniques I might do is when I use TLS, we have this TLS envelope, and then inside that we have the HTTP. Well, what I could do is the content I actually want to get to, the domain name, I put inside the HTTP, and I put a different domain name in the TLS header, the SNI, the server name indication, I put a different one. Well, this firewall can't see inside the TLS packet, it's encrypted, so it just sees the server name indication and it's domain good, so it says, okay, I'll let you through, and then when I get to the CDN and it cracks it open, what it serves up was in the HTTP request, which is a completely different domain name. And so what this change does is if the domain names don't match between the TLS, SNI, and that actually in the HTTP inside there, it will block it. It just won't allow it through. So this is blocking that domain fronting behavior. That's the whole point of that. Azure Front Door now has migrations available in preview. 
So this will let me move both from, for example, standard to premium with no downtime, and even from the old classic to standard or premium, i.e. those newer SKUs. Azure Front Door now has managed identity integration. So I can give my Azure Front Door managed identity. This can be system assigned, where that identity's lifecycle is tied to the Azure Front Door, or user assigned. It's a separate, and I can say, hey, you can use it. And where that's really useful is if now that Azure Front Door wants to go and get certificates, for example, from an Azure Key Vault, it can just use its native identity. I don't have to try and worry about some set of permissions or credentials so Azure Front Door can go and get to those certificates. So this is a, a super nice locking down the security, simplifying. Database side, Log Analytics now has table management in the portal gone GA. So this has been there for a while if you were just playing around with it, but essentially now if I just jump over and I look at Log Analytics Workspace, and I'll just pick one of them, what you see is tables. And from that tables, I can now see all of the various tables. I could create new tables, but I could also now go and look at a particular table and I could do things like, hey, I wanna manage the table. How long do I wanna have retention? I could modify those various values and I could even do things like, hey, edit the schema for some of the columns if they are editable. So now straight from the Azure portal, I can do some pretty nice stuff around that overall set of table management. Cosmos DB now has intra, so within the account, container copy jobs. So within my account, I could create a new container, which maybe has a different partition key. Um, maybe it's got some other requirement around unique keys. And on the server side, so I submit the job, it does the copy for me, it will copy the content from one container to the other container. Now it's SQL and Cassandra API accounts only, and it is offline. And what that really means is, I wanna stop writing to that source container while that copy is going on. Because if the copy has started and I start deleting things or changing things, that may not get reflected, it probably won't get reflected in the copy data. So I need to stop writing to it, hey, go and do that server-side intro account container copy job. And once it's finished, hey, I can interact, but now I've got a nice complete copy of my data that was all done on the server side. Uh, Cosmos DB, MongoDB now has retriable rights. And really this is now just a MongoDB driver for a number of failure scenarios when I'm trying to write it will just automatically retry for me. And that removes the emphasis on my code to have to go and detect if there's a failure and implement my own retry logic. So this really simplifies my code. Azure SQL Database offline migrations in preview. So from Azure Data Studio with the Azure SQL migration extension, it's really all about moving SQL Server deployments to Azure SQL Database, the PaaS service. So it will go and create a report of readiness, it will give me a report of recommended um, sizing, remediation items, and then help me with that actual migration. Um, PostgreSQL Flexible is now available in China North 3 and China East 3. Miscellaneous, Azure Automation now supports availability zones, so my run books, my artifacts, will now be in multiple availability zones if there was some localized failure. Hey, my automations will still run, they're still gonna function. There was some new virtual machine scale set cost recommendation. So Azure Advisor has been going through some massive enhancements and its recommendations around cost and performance really apply to a huge number of resources today. Hey, I can optimize, I can shrink this thing, I could change these scale settings. Well, now it's gonna do that for virtual machine scale sets as well. So it's gonna do recommendations saying, hey, um, this doesn't need to be running. Uh, hey, this has unused instances. Hey, the instance size is, the SKU is wrong. Hey, your scale settings are wrong. So it's gonna give you a whole set of recommendations to tune and optimize so I only have and therefore pay for what I really need for that virtual machine scale set. Um, Azure Virtual Desktop has private link in preview. If you think of Azure Virtual Desktop, there's a certain 
has cloud element, if I think of things like the broker, the gateway, the web feed, they're all hosted services. And there's a public endpoint that I as a client talk to to get maybe a feed of my applications to initiate the connection. And then the session host that running my virtual network, well, it has to talk to those PaaS services as well through that public endpoint. So what this private link does is now there's a private endpoint, i.e. an IP address in my virtual network that represents those, the PaaS side of Azure Virtual Desktop. And either I use it just for those session hosts to communicate to that broker, to the gateway, um, to that web feed, or it can be the session host and the client. So if I'm on a private network connected via site, site VPN or express route and um, private peering, I can now do the entire Azure virtual desktop without having to talk to any public endpoints. So it can all stay on a private network. So that, that's, that's a big deal. And then Azure managed HSM TLS offload library is in preview. So this is all part of Key Vault. So managed HSM is I get my own single tenant FIPS 140-2 level three validated hardware security module for my keys. And what I could now do is for certain virtual appliances, F5, Big IP and Nginx, when they have to do the TLS, they can actually offload that TLS. So take away the CPU burden of doing that crypt cryptographic operation it can offload it and let my dedicated HSM do it for me. So there's a library that's leveraged to be able to do that offload, and that's now in preview. And that was it. Um, I hope that was useful. Until the next video, take care.